Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for your word. <clears throat> and I pray this morning that you would bless and use it in our lives. And Lord, I pray that we would understand it and by your Holy Spirit apply it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, we've taken uh, maybe a week or two off from this series to address some, some other things. Of course, we had uh, Easter Resurrection Sunday. Um, but uh, we, uh, we're back here in this series in Hebrews. We're getting to the end of the book. I never imagined when we started out in Hebrews chapter 1 and, and verses 1 through 3, I never imagined that that would result... Uh, that by the end of the series, we would be uh, meeting this way. But we don't know everything about the future, do we? But we do know some things, and we're going we're to talk about those things this morning. Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to begin reading in verse 18. The Bible says, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they heard, uh, they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thr thrust through with a dart. So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But you are come to Mount Zion. And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For, they, for if they escaped not who refused him who spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain." Wherefore, we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. I want you to notice a couple of things uh, about our text, all right? Just a, just a couple of things uh, to, to kind of drive it home to us and, and, and anchor us in its context. In verse 18... In describing Mount Sinai and God's appearance there, uh, the Bible says that the mount, mountain burned with fire in God's presence. In verse 29, we finished up with this statement, For our God is a consuming fire. Now on Wednesday nights, we've talked about the concept of inclusio, right? The bookends on either side of a passage of scripture. And those two comments, those two mentions of fire in God's presence, uh, even in God's essence, those tell us that, that all of these verses that we just read belong together. But there's a problem. Uh, and, and the problem is this. I don't think you guys are going to listen to me preach for three hours. Uh, maybe you will. Uh, might have a cop captive audience. I'm sure Britt and John uh, and, and, um, and, and the other John, Britt and the two Johns, you know who I'm talking about. I'm sure they got enough coffee, but I don't know if they'll be, be, be taking too many bathroom breaks by the time uh, this is all over. So what I've done is I've chopped this, uh, I've chopped this message in half, and it breaks up, uh, it breaks up nicely into two, two uh, sections, but they're really on the same uh, concept. And so I'm going to give away a little bit of next week's message in this, but let me just preview that. Uh, we're going to talk about our citizenship in heaven, our heavenly citizenship this morning, and then, uh, and then next week we're going to talk about acting like we're citizens of heaven while we're here on earth, all right? And so uh, let's, let's get right into this. I want to point out to you uh, one very important phrase in verse 28, all right? In verse 28, there's, there's a very important phrase, um, and uh, uh, let's see if I can find it, all right? I'm a little... Now, I'm a little uh, out of my element. I'm not used to stopping and starting twice. So, But let's get to this very important phrase in verse 28. It says, Wherefore, we, 
receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. And I want to really focus in on, on that, particular, um, that particular phrase, that we receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved. All right, and um, and that's what I want to to really center this message on. It's a message in two parts. We'll finish the message next week, uh, but we're going to get a, a great foundation this week and some great application from it. Uh, but we are citizens not of anything in this world, but citizens of a kingdom that will not end. Now uh, I, I pass this story along to you to kind of just. To, to, to get um, to, to get the point across, I guess. Uh, but in 1986, there was a Texas gem dealer named Roy Wettstein, and Roy Wettstein was pawing through a Tupperware bowl of cheaply priced rocks at a, at a collector's um, a, a mineral show in Arizona. There was a collector there with a little booth, and Roy was 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 pawing through all of these. Uh, stones, and he comes to a lavender gray potato sized uh, stone that looked to him, to his trained eye, like a special stone. And it was marked with a price of $15. And so Roy Wettstein turned to the, to the amateur collector who was selling it. He said, You want $15 for this stone? And the collector said, Tell you what. He says, I'll let you have it for $10. It's not as pretty as the others. And so Roy Wettstein paid $10 and walked away from there with the world's largest star sapphire. Later, that rock would be valued at $2.28 million. You know, if you don't know what you possess, uh, you may be inclined to disregard it or to let it go for something far less, right? Esau did that. Uh, in, in chapter 15, if we just back up a little bit in our text, in chapter 15, the Bible says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Let, let there be, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For he know that afterward, when he would have inherited a blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Esau did not see the value of God's promises. He had uh, in his possession the birthright, uh, and, and, and he had all of God's eternal promises uh, available to him. But being entirely focused on the things of this world... Esau sold that birthright for a measly bowl of stew. Now, in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is, he's got a task that he's, that he's working on throughout this epistle. And one of those great tasks, it's a theme that keeps recurring, and throughout chapter, from chapters 10 to 12 has really been uh, hammering on it. Uh, but one of the issues is that, that the, the, the Jewish believers of the first century were dealing with or facing was that they were really tempted to leave the Christian faith and go back to Judaism. Uh, they, were, they were suffering persecution for their faith. Um, they, this persecution was part of God's plan. It was part of God's discipline for their lives. But some of them had responded sinfully to that dis discipline. They had even left their church. Um, and, and in doing so, they revealed that they were profane, that they were godless persons like Esau. They were willing to sell the birthright of faith in Christ for something so temporal. Um, and so, in other words, like Esau, they placed their focus entirely on this world and not on the kingdom of God. And after warning them to be diligent and, and to prevent any person among them from falling from the grace or falling short of God's grace, and then, and then the writer of Hebrews introduced Esau as this example of someone who did fall short of God's grace, um, then the writer of Hebrews now, in our text, he seeks to motivate these Jewish believers to 
fix their eyes on what is eternal. And what is eternal here is pictured as Mount Zion. And to fix our eyes on something eternal, Mount Zion, rather than the temporal, which would be pictured as Mount Sinai, where the law was given. He tells them to fix their eyes on the unshakable kingdom rather than the shakable temporal world. He wanted them to put all of their hope all of their faith, all of their trust in God's kingdom. Now, how could he convince them to do this? Well, he, he called them, in order to get them to do this, to consider God's kingdom uh, and to, to cling to that, he called them to consider their own true citizenship. In Christ, they were citizens of Zion, not citizens of Sinai. They were citizens of God's unshakable kingdom, not citizens of this shaking and, and falling away world. And so considering that fact would cause them to appreciate the value of what they had in Christ and to live with an unshakable confidence in their Lord Jesus Christ. And that unshakable confidence would then empower them and allow them uh, to... to endure temptation, to endure the persecution that they were going through. And so, and so uh, the writer of Hebrews is telling them and, con and, and, and calling on them to consider their citizenship. And through this text, the author of Hebrews is doing the same for us. All right, It's easy to get our eyes off of God's kingdom and to focus on this temporal, shaking world. Um, Especially us who, who live, we live in America, we live in, in a, a country where the things of this world are so readily available uh, and, and we have so much. Uh, and it's so easy to get our eyes fixed on those things. What does it look like? What does it look like when we are focused on this world rather than God's kingdom? What is that? How does that play out practically in our lives? Well, Jesus identified it well. And he speaks of that in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 31, Jesus said, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Jesus said, Take no thought. That means do not be anxious. Don't get so worried and caught up in, in uh, these things. Jesus said, this is what the Gentiles do. They, they get, uh, this is what unbelievers do. Uh, they live for this world. They have no part in the kingdom of God. Now, um, what do they do as a result of looking and living for this world? They, to the point of anxiety, they seek the physical things of this life. Jesus gave some examples. And this is not an exhaustive list. It's just three very primary examples. Jesus said they seek after food and drink and clothing, and they're, they're really worried about all of those things, these physical things. What, but, but what did Jesus tell us to do in contrast? He lays down the contrast in verse 33. He says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In other words, God will take care of your needs. You just focus on his kingdom. In Hebrews chapter 12, we find the very same message, all right? The Holy Spirit wants us to take our eyes off of what is, is temporal, off of what is shaking and passing away, off of the things of this world, and to fix our eyes on what is eternal and what, is, what cannot be shaking and what will last forever. How then can we do that? How can we... I mean, we, we live in this temporal world, right? We have to eat and drink. We better have clothes on when we go out, right? Um, we, we have to have houses to live in. We should have a job uh, to provide for our needs. We, we need to think about we, when, when the bills come in, we, we better write some checks, right? Uh, and so we have to think about these things. We want to have nice things. How does the Holy Spirit seek to move our eyes off of those things and to place them on the unshakable kingdom of God? How does he do that? Well, one way that God works is to shake this world, right? And we see that shaking now, don't we? We see, well, well actually we don't. We may see kind of tremors of it. 
Okay, maybe, maybe just a little warm-up, but we're not seeing the shaking that is eventually going to come. Uh, but we, we are getting an idea that these things are temporal, right? Uh, but that's one way God works to get our eyes on the eternal. But our text tells us a different method. And this method has been used for the last, at least the last 2,000 years. Uh, our text calls on us to consider God's kingdom and our citizenship in that kingdom. And here's really the point I want to get across to you this morning in the first half of our two-half message, all right? Uh, but this is what you need to know. As citizens of God's unshakable kingdom, we must live with unshakable confidence. As citizens of God's unshakable kingdom, we must live with unshakable confidence. If we consider our citizenship in God's unshakable kingdom, we will be able to live with unshakable confidence in the Lord. Uh, this will cause us to live confidently, not just when we get to heaven, but in this world so that we will not be overcome by, uh, by panic and fear, and so that we will not be overcome by the temptation, the daily temptation to sin, and so that we will not be overcome by despair, and so that we will not be, be tempted to renounce our faith, to go back to the world, to get back into the things out of which we were saved, the old life. And so as citizens of God's unshakable kingdom, we must live with unshakable confidence. And so, this morning, let us consider our citizenship that is in heaven. And I want to consider four aspects of our citizenship in heaven this morning. Four aspects of that citizenship. Number one, uh, our citizenship, consider this, our citizenship is anchored on God's promise. Our citizenship is anchored on God's promise. When we feel restless in this world, we can rest not in some fantasy, not in some psychological um, thing that we work up in our minds to make us feel better. No, we can rest on the promises of God. According to His Word, we are not citizens of this world, but of God's unmovable kingdom. And so we anchor our hope on God's promise and he anchors our citizenship on the same promise. In verse 28, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. What in the world? That is the greatest promise. What has God promised to us? Two things. Two things. Uh, one, he's promised that we have received his kingdom. That's a promise from God. If you have received Christ, and you have your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it's, it's more than just um, hope for a far-off day. It is that. But it is also this. You have received His kingdom. That's a promise from God. He's, that's the first promise. The second promise is this. His kingdom will not be moved. It cannot go away. It will last forever. It's going to be a whole lot better than when you pull out your phone and look at the stock market. It's not going to go up and down. It's just going up and up and up. That is the dual promise from God. One, you've received his kingdom. Two, that kingdom's not going anywhere. It's never going to be moved. And because of this promise of God, we can live with unshakable confidence in this citizenship. You know, um, we homeschool. Everybody homeschools these days, but... Uh, but Lisa's been homeschooling the kids for several years, and she does a great job. And sometimes I listen in on the, on the, uh, on the lesson. And in history, they've been studying the seven wonders of the ancient world. And, uh, and these, these seven wonders, they were impressive creations of human genius. They're fun to study. Uh, and think about this. The, the tomb of Mausoleus built in 350 B.C., where we get the term mausoleum from. Uh, the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus was one of them. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon, constructed by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, King Ptolemy's lighthouse near Alexandria was massive. There was a hundred-foot statue to, Apollos, uh, or to Apollo uh, called the Colossus at the city of Rhodes. Um, there was a 40-foot statue of Zeus on, uh, uh, on uh, Olympia, of Olympia. And then the great pyramids of Egypt. All those, all those um, wonders were lauded by ancient man, and they they stood in awe to look at them. Um, now think about this: six of these remarkable achievements have been destroyed. The lighthouse was destroyed by an earthquake. 
The other five were demolished by plunderers. Only the pyramids of Giza remain, uh, or the pyramids of Egypt, only they remain. And even those were looted uh, years ago. And so we may marvel over these seven wonders of the ancient world, but we must never forget that everything in our world is temporary. There are some impressive buildings today, aren't there? Stadiums that seat tens and, and, and hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, but guess what? Those stadiums are empty anymore, aren't they? They're proving what? That they are temporary. Um, and so uh, this, this world may seem great. They may, the, the world may seem like the, the ultimate reality, but these things are not. They are movable. They are changing. But God who does not change has promised us a kingdom which shall never be changed, never be moved, never be shaken. And so he calls us to place all of our confidence in, in our citizenship in, this, in his kingdom. And so as citizens of God's unshakable kingdom, we must live with unshakable confidence. Our confidence builds as we consider our citizenship in that kingdom. And so the first consideration is this. Our citizenship is anchored in God's promise. Now let's consider a second aspect of our citizenship, and that is this. Number two, our citizenship is our present possession. It is our present possession. We are not going to be citizens of heaven someday. No, we already are citizens of heaven, citizens of God's kingdom. We do not hope to have e e eternal life someday. We have eternal life now. We just take John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He doesn't say shall have everlasting life. He says when you believe, you'll not perish because you will have, present tense, Everlasting life. Now I know televangelists can do some pretty impressive things, but I can tell you one thing that I'm going to do that's impressive. I'm going to live forever. Amen? Uh, I am never going to die. Do you believe that? Uh, and, and, and the reason why is because I am, I am not someone who's waiting to have eternal life, but by the grace of Jesus Christ, I already have it. And if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ this morning, you have it too. It is a present possession. Consider our citizenship in God's kingdom. It is our present possession. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22. I want to draw you there in our text. He says, he's already told, uh, they, they've already told the... Uh, told us that we're not members of Mount Zion. We, we haven't come to Mount Zion. And now we're going to see a sharp contrast there in verse 22. But ye are come. You are come, not you shall come. You are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, uh, notice how our coming to Mount Zion is described. Not in the future tense, but in the present tense. Ye are come to Mount Zion. Our citizenship, that is our present possession. This truth implies two things. One, it implies that we are not earning our way into God's kingdom by what we do here on earth. We are not doing special works that, that will gain us uh, a prominent place. We're not doing special works that are uh, going to gain us entrance. No, we are already in. Everything that we do in this life, we do as citizens of God's kingdom. The second thing it implies is that we cannot lose our place in God's kingdom. Yes, we are in, and it will not change, and that doesn't change. And so, as citizens of God's unshakable kingdom, we must live with unshakable confidence. Our confidence builds, then, as we consider this. Our citizenship anchored in God's promise. Secondly, our citizenship is our present possession. Let me give you a third aspect of our citizenship in heaven. And that is this. Our citizenship is filled with heavenly privileges. Our citizenship is just filled with heavenly privileges. In the world, the world, the flesh, and the devil, they want you to believe that God's kingdom is nothing more than an escape from judgment. Think about that for a minute. A lot of people... They don't necessarily want to go to heaven and be with God. They just don't want to face judgment, right? Uh, but that's how the devil wants you to think about it. That's how the world wants you to think about it. And uh, in other words, um, they want you to think, oh, well, I don't want to end up in hell, so, well, I guess I have to go to heaven. 
uh, other than that, there's not much there to desire. And so, uh, while I'm here on earth, I better have all the fun I can, because then I'm going to die and live forever, but it's not going to be, I mean, I'm not going to really enjoy it like this. No. Nothing could be further from the truth. We, uh, we, <laughs> we haven't even hardly, uh, we've experienced some of the glories, some of the joys of the Christian life. But there's coming a day when we will be like Him and we will see Him as He is. And what a glorious day that's going to be. Our, our citizenship is filled with heavenly privileges, wonders, and splendors we cannot yet comprehend. And so, what are these privileges? I'm glad you asked. What are these privileges? They're listed for us, several of them. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but it hits the highlights, all right? And here are some of the great privileges that we enjoy as citizens of the kingdom. Privilege number one, we have come to a privileged place. Look at verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, and to the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, and so we're coming to a privileged place place or we have come to a privileged place Mount Zion the heavenly Jerusalem the city of the living God all three of those descriptors are speaking of the same place uh, and it is the place where God is the 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 city of Jerusalem was in the Old Testament described as the city of our God uh, the psalmist said great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the side of the north, the city of our great King. And the greatest thing about that city was that God was there. Uh, and so we are coming to the, the greatest place ever, the city of our God. Think about some places you'd like to go right now. Most of you probably might have the beach in mind, right? Somewhere warm and sunny, somewhere on vacation, somewhere beautiful, right? Well, all of the things, all the images you can conjure up in your mind are nothing compared to the place that we're going. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And so it's going to be tailor-made, I think. Uh, tailor-made around God's glory. But for our best, our best, in our best uh, good too, and so we're going to a privileged place. Secondly, we're not only going to a privileged place, but think about this: we are going to be counted among privileged people. All the privileges that come with this citizenship, one of the privileges, one of the great privileges, is our fellow citizens. Uh, you, you ever? Um, been around a group of people and you just want to get away. Uh, I mean, you, you not that you hate people, but, but I mean, there's just, sometimes you just need to get away from certain people, right? Well, guess what? In heaven, that is never going to happen. You're never going to be in a party of people or in a group of people in heaven and think, oh, this is a bore. Uh, or, or you're never going to be disappointed with any person in, in heaven. Never disappointed. Why? Because we are going to be among the greatest class of people ever. The greatest class of beings ever. And let me describe some of those from our, from our scripture passage here in verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. And now it's going to, there it's described the place. Now it's going to, going to describe the people to whom we have come. You have come to an innumerable company of angels. To the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. To God, and to God the judge of all. And to the spirits of just men made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And so we've come to an innumerable company of angels. The angels are introduced to here because they are the usual accompaniment of God's glory and his ministers as well. He makes his, his angels, his ministers, a flame of fire, the Bible says. Um, so in addition to, uh, and, and here the Bible says, uh, uses the term, um, <clears throat> the general assembly uh, in the church of the firstborn. See, and, and I think the church and the angels really revolve around that term, the general assembly. And so we're coming to the angels of God. Uh, and, and, and they are assembled around the throne of God, if you can see this in your mind, just offering the most glorious worship that's ever been offered. And guess what? In that, into that general assembly is included. Um, in that celebration is included um, 
the church of the firstborn, the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. Where are they written in heaven? Well, they're written in the Lamb's book of life. And so it cannot be erased. Um, and so the term firstborn often meant in scripture uh, that it was the most excellent, the chief. Not necessarily the, a person born uh, uh, in, in the right order, but uh, it means the most excellent or the chief. Jesus Christ, be, because of the excellence of his character, is said to be in scripture the firstborn among many brothers, Romans 8, 29. Uh, or Romans chapter 8, I mean, uh, and then the firstborn over all creation in Colossians chapter 1, and then the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself may become the first in everything, Colossians 1.18, that he may have the preeminence. And so when it says the church of the firstborn, it's talking about the church of Jesus. He's the firstborn. And we are his church, the bride, the body of Christ. And guess what? When angels stand round the throne, and when they give that glorious honor and, and majesty and, and worship to Jesus, guess what? They're not going to be doing it by themselves. We're going to join in with them. And this is a great privilege. And one of the things that I really look forward to, I imagine when we are in that scene, that we won't have to conjure up worship. In other words, we won't have to get ourselves into the mood I think that that worship is just going to erupt out of our out of our bodies, just just come from us naturally as we stand in awe of the of the person of God, but also as side by side, shoulder to shoulder with each and every one of us, there are angels and saints also giving all the glory to God. There are times in this life when we have a reaction just erupt out of our out of our mouth without even thinking about it just 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 the emotion of it just the the desire of it erupting out of our mouth uh, for instance those of you who are sports fans and maybe you're watching your favorite team and if you're like me you're you're watching the Michigan Wolverines and they're not playing against the Ohio State Buckeyes all right uh, they're playing some other team and they score a touchdown and and, uh, and and you're just imagine you're watching the Cubs or the Cardinals or something like that and they they hit that home run or they score that touchdown to win the game what happens it just erupts out of your out of your mouth yeah right and 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 that's fun in your living room but have you ever gone to a ball game and you're, at the, you're with the home team and, uh, and, and, and uh, the, the home team scores the winning touchdown or the winning field goal and you erupt, yeah, you're happy, but 80,000 people also do the same thing at the same time. And, and, and that's an exciting, that's an amazing feeling. Um, it's nothing compared to the eruption that is going to take place in the throne room of, he of heaven as we are among privileged people. This is our privilege. Uh, being, being with the, the general assembly gathered with the saints and angels, the church of the firstborn. And so all believers by nature, were, by nature we, were children, we were children of wrath, but Christ has included us in the firstborn. And so now, being in the firstborn, we have that inheritance. Uh, of, of, uh, according to Ephesians chapter 1, we have the inheritance of heaven. Now, we come among these, these people, the privileged people, and we come now into the presence of the most privileged person, God, who is judge of all. And without exception, without exception, uh, all human beings must stand before God and be judged. There's no exceptions to that. But the glory of the gospel is that believers may stand before Jesus and may stand before God without fear in that judgment. Because Jesus has justified us and taken away all of our sins for which God would judge us. This is the opposite of the picture on Mount Sinai. The, the spirits of just men made perfect here are with us. And they, and they offer the praise with us to Jesus. And I imagine it's going to be something like this. Psalm 1611. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, at thy right hand, there are pleasures 
forevermore. As we come in among these privileged people into the presence of the most privileged person, and we shout for joy, it will be the greatest joy that's ever been experienced in any of God's creatures. And guess what? It will never end. Do you notice a common theme, by the way, uh, do you notice a common theme in the heavenly privileges that we've mentioned? The common theme is that they all revolve not around us, not around our desires and our dreams. They all revolve around God himself. And you might say, well, isn't God rather a narcissist? I mean, he's created heaven and earth and all this just for everybody to worship him. What kind of an kind of a, a, a arrogant person does that? And the answer to that question would be that it would be arrogant for me to do that to require worship, or for you to do it, or for any man to, to require such things. But it is not so for God. See, God desires our greatest good, our greatest benefit. God wants what is best for us. And what is best for us? Well, let's, let's ask this question. What is best? What is the definition of goodness? What is the definition of joy? What is the definition of love? What is the definition of holiness? What is the... What is, Everything that is good combined into one concept, that is God. And so there is nothing better for you, nothing better for me, than to be totally focused on that good person, God. And so that's why heaven is all focused on Him and on worship of Him, because anything else would be, would be less, and big time less. So... He is the greatest good, the greatest glory, the greatest pleasure, the greatest being in the universe. And so heaven is focused, focused on Him. As citizens of God's unshakable kingdom, then, we must live with unshakable confidence. Confidence knowing that this is in our future. See, it, the, it says in the present tense, um, For ye are come... To the mount. And that's talking about our position. We're already there in position. Christ is seated in the heavenly places and we are in Christ. But we haven't quite experienced it yet, right? There's an already but not yet uh, aspect to the kingdom of God. We're already in, but we have not yet experienced all of those glories. But we can live with confidence. So as citizens of God's unshakable kingdom, we must live with unshakable confidence. And it builds as we, this confidence builds as we consider our citizenship. First, we consider that our citizenship is anchored in God's promises. Secondly, we have considered that our citizenship is our present possession. And thirdly, we have considered that our citizenship is filled with heavenly privileges. All the privilege. Uh, the privilege of coming before God with His privileged people in that privileged place. Lastly, let's consider... Uh, our, our citizenship is provided by God's covenant. Our citizenship is provided by God's covenant. We cannot earn it. We cannot get it on our own. We are citizens of God's kingdom. It is, if we are citizens of God's kingdom, it is because that citizenship was provided for us when, and then given to us by Jesus Christ. Um, and, and the means by which he has done that is his covenant. The greatest temptation for the original readers of this book was the temptation to walk away from Christ and go back to the Jewish religion, which we could just call the Old Covenant. All right. Now, some had already, had already done that. Hebrews 10.25 tells us that some had already... Um, walked away, proving that their faith was not genu genuine. Uh, how did the writer of Hebrews seek to dissuade believers from this apostasy? Well, he reminded them that they, they cannot come to God by any other means than to go through the blood of Jesus Christ in the new covenant. You see, outside of God's covenant, we can never approach His presence. Not outside of His covenant. Look at verse 18 with me here. We back up a little bit. The Bible says, For ye are not come unto the mount that, that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, 
in the sound of a trumpet, in the voice of words, which voice they, they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. But they could not endure that which was commanded. And so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. And so uh, here the, uh, the writer of Hebrews harkens back to, to uh, Exodus chapters 19 and 20 when Israel had come out of Egypt and they came to Mount Sinai where God gave the law of Moses. He gave the law to Moses, the Ten Commandments. Moses goes up in the mountain. But when God gave them that law, the children of Israel encamped at the foot of the mountain and, and uh, there was some amazing phenomena. We'll get into that in just a second. Uh, but Mount Sinai is where God's presence, uh, giving the law, it produced terrifying sights. His presence produced terrifying sights. Look at this, blackness. What is blackness? Well, it was a thick cloud. And whenever God appeared uh, many times in the Old Testament, there was something veiling his total um, visibility. And usually a thick, dark cloud. He spoke to Job out of a storm, out of a tempest. Uh, and he has a, he, his presence filled the temple in Solomon's time with a thick, dark cloud. And here at uh, Mount Sinai, there was a thick, dark cloud veiling him. And then there's also this term... That was the term blackness. There's this term in our translation um, that says darkness, skados, which means it speaks of deep gloom. So you got darkness in a cloud and, and deep gloom hanging over this mountain. And then on top of that, you have a tempest, you have a storm. And I don't know what's going on in this storm, if it's lots of wind, maybe lightning and thunder, but it was very fearsome. And it, was, and it put the people of Israel into terror. Uh, so at, at Mount Sinai, at Mount Sinai, God produced God's presence produced terrifying sights. At the same time, at Mount Sinai, God's presence produced terrifying sounds. Uh, in verse 18, we have the sound of a trumpet. Now, what what does that mean? Was someone playing taps or playing, uh, you know, something on the trumpet? No, uh, we think of a trumpet like something in a symphony, but this trumpet sound, and the trumpet sounds you see a lot in the Old Testament are either a summons or a call to war. And here it's a summons. The trumpet summons them to stand before the judge of all the earth with lightning and thunder and gloom and darkness. What a terrifying sound that trumpet was. But then there was another even more terrifying sound, and that was a voice that shook the, the mountain and trembled the earth that they were standing on when God spoke everything shook with the power of his voice and so when Israel received the old covenant at Mount Sinai God actually spoke audibly to them they heard his voice from that mountain shaking everything and, and, and uttering his commands could you imagine the terror of that moment at Mount Sinai then God's presence produced terrifying sights and terrifying sounds, but it also produced a terrified reaction. Actually, two terrified reactions. How did God's people react to hearing God's voice? Well, they were overcome by sheer terror. And so they begged Moses that they might not hear the voice of God anymore. Um, and so it says in verse 19, uh, they which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. And so they begged Moses that they might not hear God's voice anymore. They wanted Moses to go up to the mountain, get the commandments from God, and then come back to the people. And by the way, God granted them this. How did Moses, that's how the people reacted, sheer terror. How did Moses react to God's voice? Well, it says in verse 21, So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So, even Moses, he was, all, he was overcome by fear and terror. Um, why? Why was this going on? Well, the primary purpose of this terror uh, was to convince the people that God was absolutely unapproachable. Uh, God had drawn a boundary around that mountain and said, You, can, you cannot come here. You cannot touch the foot of this mountain. If you do, you're going to die. Even an animal touches it. And if an animal touches it, we want you to execute it by 
a, a stone or an arrow, you can't even touch the animal that touched the mountain. God's chosen people could not approach. And a person might be tempted to say, oh, hey, I'm good enough. My good works are good enough to let me stand before God. So that, uh, and, and to that person, our text says, God's chosen people, Israel, couldn't do that. And even Moses, the, one of the great saints of all time, said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling, uh, one, so one must be a better saint than Moses. The great man of God was terrified in the presence of God at Sinai. How much more should we be terrified of our God who says he is a consuming fire? So God under the old covenant was unapproachable. Their sins were not yet covered by the blood of Christ. Therefore, God's holy presence could, would absolutely consume them if they dared to approach him. Because it says... In verse 18, the fire burned on that mountain. Why? Well, verse 29 tells us our God is a consuming fire. And so we see that outside of God's covenant, we could never approach His presence. But that's not all, because inside of God's covenant, we can never be banished from His presence. Inside God's covenant, we who were once dead in trespasses and sins are made alive unto God. The, the middle wall of partition is broken down and we the, the veil on the temple is ripped in two. And by the blood of Christ, we enter into the holiest of all. We can never be banished from the presence of God. In verse 24, and we have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Think about this. We've come to Jesus, the mediator. He's the mediator of this new covenant. Uh, and by the way, the old covenant pointed to the new covenant. So to leave the new covenant and so supposedly go back to the old covenant is not even to go back to the old covenant. It's really just go out of covenant with God. Uh, because the, the Israelites under the Old Testament, um, they were following God in the old covenant. And they received salvation in that old covenant on the basis that Jesus would someday come and, and, and wash their sins away. They weren't trusting those commandments to save them. They were trusting God's grace to save them. Uh, and so the old covenant's not a bad thing. It's a bad thing, uh, in fact, to, to say, I don't want any part of the new covenant in Christ, and I'll go back to this old covenant. To do that is not even to go back to the old covenant, but to forsake both of them. But here, Jesus, in verse 15 of chapter 9, is, is described as the mediator of the new covenant. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant, the new testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions, that we, under the first testament, they which are called might be, receive the promise of eternal inheritance. In God's old covenant, animal sacrifices were made to atone for the sins of the people. And God did forgive their sins, but those animal sacrifices did not truly atone for those sins. Rather, those animal sacrifices pointed to the new covenant, to the new blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, and God's people in the old covenant were forgiven on that basis. But the old covenant had expired. Hebrews 8.13 says it, it, was, it had passed away, it, it was obsolete. And, and for someone to attempt to go back to it, they have to reject Jesus and his sacrifice. They would have no mediator between God and themselves. But we have this mediator. The one God and one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And we have come to him. And we have come as citizens of his kingdom. We come to him, but also not just to him, not, not just that, but also we come to the blood of sprinkling. In the old covenant, it was ratified. It was put into place by animal sacrifice, wherein Moses took the blood of, of the animal sacrifice and he sprinkled it on the priests. And he sprinkled it on the altar and he even sprinkled it on the book of the law. Uh, and did, in doing so, he ratified God's covenant with Israel. But Jesus ratified God's new covenant with, with his own blood when he died for our sins on the cross and arose from the grave and sprinkled his blood for us. So that every sinner who repents of, of his sin comes to Jesus for the forgiveness of salvation and enters into the new covenant by the blood of Jesus Christ. So... And, and that blood, by the way, says that it speaks better things than that of Abel. What does that mean? Well, Abel's blood 
cried to God from the ground for vengeance, right? Un, un, uh, uncarried out vengeance. It cried for vengeance. Well, the blood of Jesus doesn't cry out vengeance. It cries out mercy. And it cries out grace. And so it speaks better than that of Abel. And so it means that the holy wrath against, uh, God's holy wrath against our sin was satisfied when Christ died and sprinkled his blood for our sin in our place. For he's made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You know, years ago, uh, a group of pioneers were making their way across uh, one of the central states to a distant place that had, that had opened up for homesteading. And so uh, they were traveling, of course, in a covered wagons, uh, a covered wagon train drawn by oxen, and the progress, of course, is necessarily slow. Well, one day they were horrified to see a, a long line of smoke in the, in, in coming from the west and stretching for miles across the, the prairie, and it soon became evident to them that the dried grass of the prairie was burning fiercely, and it was coming toward them rapidly. And they had crossed a river the day before, but it would be impossible to go that far back uh, in time and so, uh, and before the flames would get to them. And so one man uh, in the group, he seemed to have a good understanding of these, things, of these things, and he said, and he told them what should be done. He gave the command to set the grass on fire behind them. And so they set the grass on fire behind them, and then a space was burned over. And so the whole company moved back upon that space that was already burned over as they waited the approaching flames. And as the flames roared toward them from the west, one little girl cried out in terror. And she said, are you sure that we should not be burned up? The leader replied, my child, the flames cannot reach us here, for we are standing where the fire has already been. What a picture of the believer who is safe in Jesus Christ. The fires of God's judgment burned. The, the fires of God's wrath burned themselves out in Jesus. And all who are in Christ are safe forever and are now standing where the fire has already been. And we, we can live confidently in that. Oh, the joy of knowing that we are in the new covenant. Our citizenship is provided by God's new covenant covenant and we are standing where the fire has already been God's wrath has burned itself out and is no longer standing against us would you be a wise investor if you traded ten dollars for two point two eight million dollars would you be a, a wise investor if you gave up a t if, if you took a ten dollar bill for two and a quarter million dollars no <laughs> Some guy in, in Arizona made that trade. Why? Well, he made that trade because he just did not consider the value of that gem. Let us not make the same mistake when it comes to the unshakable kingdom of God. Let us, let us live confidently. Uh, let us consider the value of our citizenship. Our citizenship is anchored on God's promise. Our citizenship is our present possession. Our citizenship is filled with heavenly privileges. And our citizenship is provided by God's covenant. As citizens of God's unshakable kingdom, we must live with unshakable confidence. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know what I'm talking about. If you do not know Christ as your Savior this morning, I implore you this morning to repent of your sins and to turn to Jesus Christ by faith and put your faith and trust in Him. Ask Him to forgive your sins and to take away your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Ask Him to save your soul from now and forever and He will do that. Uh, the Bible says the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and He can be yours. For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For those of us who are saved, who have the kingdom as a present possession, let us cling to that kingdom. Let us live in absolute confidence, knowing that God's kingdom is unshakable, and so is our citizenship, and so is our confidence.